I plot um, the results of this equation as a function of, of d, d over r naught squared. Well, where did that come from? comes from the math. Everything else in the argument of the exponential is a number. n is, uh, n is uh, 1, 2, 3, pi is pi. So the only real intrinsic variable here is d, t, and r squared, r naught squared. So that, if you want to <coughs> plot versus time, you can. If you want to plot versus time relative to the size, then is dt over r naught squared. It will always be that because it's the only things that make, that have, it, have no units. Whenever you have a transcendental function, sine, cosine, inverse, hyperbolic tangent, whatever, the argument of that function must be dimensionless. And so dt over r naught squared is dimensionless, so that's the proper um, quantity to, to, to give you a generalized plot. And that's, that's why I picked that to represent the time-dependent variable. And the reason the distance is, is done that way is because the distance always shows up relative to the radius of the sphere, relative to R0. So if you want to have a universal plot, you plot distance is R over R0, sorry. And uh, the appropriate time variable then is dt over R0 squared. That's one. <coughs> you have to start learning to think in terms of dimensions. It's very important. It will make your lives much easier whenever you're working with equations. Okay, so let me get on to the remainder of this. We finished the sphere the other day. <clears throat> uh, we got up to here. <clears throat> so uh, this 99% equilibration time is the time for the sphere to come within 1% of being completely full, which means that the concentration everywhere inside the sphere has become equal to the outside concentration. Um, and so taking dt over r naught squared, putting in the, the right value for that for, to be 0.99, um, you calculate these times for, for spheres of this di uh, radius and with this diffusion coefficient. This diffusion coefficient here is typical of a small organic molecule. Um, my favorite small organic molecule is benzene. Um, and it's got a diffusion coefficient at room temperature in a, in a liquid like the viscosity of water of 10 to the minus 5 centimeters squared per second. And that means that for a 3 micron radius, radius particle, it's going to take about 4.2 milliseconds for that sphere to become 99% of equilibrium. It, in principle, never, ever, ever, ever reaches exactly 100%. That takes an infinite amount of time. If you increase the size of the particle from 3 microns to 5 microns, we see that the time required goes up more considerably. If you double 3, you get 6, right? Well, this is, this is more than double 4.2. In fact, it's the square. It's it's the ratio of five over three squared. Now, if we go down this way and we make the diffusion coefficient ten times smaller, well, then the the time required for equilibrium does go up a factor of ten because it's inverse with diffusion time. 
of diffusion coefficient. The smaller the diffusion coefficient, the slower the process is. Uh, this number here would be typical of, uh, oh, say, a peptide of molecular weight 5,000 Daltons. And that number would be more representative of a good-sized protein like uh, serum albumin with a molecular weight of about 60,000. Um, so you can see that, that both the diffusion coefficient and the size of the particle are very important. But the size of the particle, the time goes with the square. You can see that easily right here. If we go from 10 micron to 100 micron particle, we go from 46 milliseconds to 4.6 seconds. That's a big increase in the equilibration time. Now we're going to talk about diffusion into, into an empty film. So let me sketch the geometry. Suppose I have a wall which is impenetrable. And encoded on that wall is a uniform film. And that's going to be the film thickness. And the the film is going to be an initially empty of, of analyte or solute or whatever you want to call the stuff that's moving around. And right immediately outside of the film, the concentration <coughs> of stuff that's diffusing is going to be C naught, C super zero, and there's going to be an infinite supply of it so that it never drops below C0, even though some diffuses into the film. And then we let it fill the film. What that looks like is, this is distance on the <coughs> horizontal axis, and distance is x. And we're going to take the distance relative to the film thickness so x equals 0 is the impenetrable wall. And then x equal to df right here is, is how thick the film is. And so just outside the film, the concentration, the normalized concentration, c over c0, is equal to 1. If I were to plot dt over df squared equals 0, there would be nothing anywhere inside the film. The concentration would be 0 at all x's. And then it would come up vertically and then go flat, equal to the outside concentration. So c over c0 would be, would be unity. Now, at very short time, 0.02, um, the diffusion, the gradient looks like this, and there's essentially no solute <coughs> at the wall. It just hasn't had time for a significant amount of the solute to get over to the wall. I'm not saying it's zero. It's a very, very, very small number, but you just can't see it because it's so small. If you allow the time dt over df squared to go get bigger, go to 0 0.1, then you see that some stuff, a significant amount of stuff has gotten to the wall. And as time progresses, the gradient uh, uh, gets longer and gets flatter and flatter and flatter. And uh, when we're at a dt over df squared equals 1, it's not quite happy yet. It's not completely full. It would be at <coughs> diffusional equilibrium with a larger value of dt over df squared. Again, in principle, it takes an infinite amount of time to become, to get to perfect equilibrium. Okay, so that's, that's the, the diffusion stuff I wanted to talk with you about. Um, 
we're going to change topics again, and we're going to talk about the, the Giddings random walk approach to uh, peak broadening in chromatography. I want to show you a calculation um, in this program right here, with any luck. I'm going to need my keyboard. I'm not going to play music, it's the keyboard. Explain what you're going to see. Could you get that uh, light for me, please? Didn't even bring that pointer. Okay, what we're going to do is look at two different kinds of molecules. One's going to be blue, and one I think is magenta. <coughs> and we're going to put these molecules that are going to show up as, as dots in the front of a column. And we're going to turn on flow. The molecules are going to be pushed through the column. Now, in any given increment of time, let's say 0.1 seconds, arbitrary increment of time, there's a certain probability that the molecules will adsorb. Now, if they adsorb, they enter the stationary phase, and they don't move down the column. So I've got two different kinds of molecules, the blue and the pink. I'm going to assign two different probabilities of adsorption. Okay? Now, in any given cycle, a given molecule has that assigned probability of adsorbing. If it adsorbs, it does not move. If it doesn't adsorb, it's in the mobile phase, it's going to move, right? What, what I want you to see is that a random process can lead to a separation. It doesn't sound like it ought to be able to, but if there's a difference in the probabilities of adsorbing, and conversely a difference in the probabilities of desorbing, then in fact the, the two populations will separate. Okay. Now, uh, to, to make the separation really easy, I'm going to take some pretty big differences um, in, in the probabilities of adsorption. So I'm going to take the first class, and I'm going to give it a probability of, of adsorbing, sorbing, of 50%. So the probability that it doesn't sorb has got to be 50%. So I'll enter that. Now I'm going to take the other probability of sorption. I'm going to make it 80%. Okay? So its probability of being not adsorbed is 20%. So the second class is more likely to adsorb than the first class. So it it's the average molecule, the average molecule of the second class is going to move slower than the average molecule of the first class, right? Let's see what happens. So there's the 80. And we'll let it rip. Oh, isn't that nice? What? I have no idea why that's not. I'm 
I don't know why that that is not showing up up there. It, everything that shows up here should be up there, beyond me. I stopped it in the middle. I want to put out the rest of the I don't know if this is going to help or not. Does that help? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. In fact, they've already separated. The blue ones are leading the, the, the magenta ones. Let me run it some more. are all out of the column now. The magenta is roughly a little bit more than halfway. Okay? I'm going to do another run and I'm going to take the first class of molecules and I'm going to say that they have no probability of absorbing. None. They don't absorb zero probability. What that means, of course, is that they're always going to be in the mobile phase. And then I'll put 50% for the other class molecules. blue ones are in front. Notice the distribution of the blue ones. There is none. How can there be? They never ever adsorb. Okay? They never adsorb. So they all have to be moving in lockstep down to the end of the column. So they all come out at the end of the column in an infinitely narrow, this can't be infinitely narrow, it has to be because the pixel, there's not an infinite number of pixels here. Um, but they, they come out in a single pulse at the exit of the column. <coughs> and then they're followed sometime later uh, by the other class that absorbs 50% and desorbs 50%. Now notice, this is already fairly wide, even though they haven't gotten that far down the column. The, it, it's conceivable if you had a, a really an Avogadro's number of molecules, it's conceivable that a very small number of molecules of the second class might never absorb. Quite a, some of them are going to absorb once. Some are going to absorb 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 1,000 times. There's a distribution of numbers of times that they absorb because this is a random process. Okay? <clears throat> this, is, this is exactly the problem that Giddings and Eyring solved a long time ago in the early 1950s. This, in fact, was Cal Giddings's. PhD dissertation project. Um, and so they worked out the mathematics of what this peak is going to look like. But it's exactly this process that I'm talking about here of a molecule that's absorbing randomly and the number of times it absorbs goes, you know, has to be has to run from zero because it's conceivable that a molecule could get through the whole column without absorbing even once on up to a very, very, very large number of, of adsorptions. And you have, to, you have to sum up all of those to get and average it over the whole population to get the retention time of an average molecule. And that's what we talk about when we talk about retention time. It's the retention time of, of the average molecule, of one half of the population of the solutes.
so. So that's what we did on the computer, and I'll, I'm going to put this program on the, uh, the Google folder, run it, you'll have fun with it. It's really quite interesting to watch it. Um, it's an executable file, which um, your computer is probably going to say to you something like, do you really want to run this program that might take over your computer? And, I haven't built the virus in or anything like that to make your lives miserable. Okay, so we're going to talk now about the, the random walk model of peak broadening. And uh, these are the different kinds of processes that, that uh, the random walk has been applied to. It's most easily applied to the problem of of longitudinal molecular diffusion, the B term in the Van Meter. Um, it's fairly easily applied to um, the slow transfer between phases. The, the application to the eddy dispersion is a little bit tougher. Uh, that we, we won't even get to that today. Okay, so again, here's what we're doing. We have an analyte molecule A, and it's in the mobile phase, which I call the desorbed site. And there's a certain probability of its undergoing adsorption, and that will put it into the stationary phase or the sorbed state. Actually, the probability of adsorption and the probability of desorption are, are governed by the rate constant for adsorption and the rate constant for desorption. And these, these are realistically, they're just chemical rate constants where the Ka is the rate constant in that direction and the Kd is the rate constant in, in the opposite direction. And by the way, we'll, we'll, we'll get into this later, the retention factor which is closely related to the equilibrium constant, is, ju is just really the ratio of the adsorption rate constant to the desorption rate constant. Both rate constants are simple first order chemical rate constants, so they have units of inverse time. So I'm going to give them units of seconds to the minus one. A little more realistically, these numbers are more like milliseconds to the minus one, or 10 milliseconds to the minus one. Okay, so as I said, Giddings and Eyring solved this mathematical problem. And what they found out is that the, the probability that a molecule will come out of the column at time t, after injection, the injection point is called time zero, the probability that it will come out of the column at time t is equal to a quantity theta, a number theta, which I'll tell you about in a minute, divided by ts, where ts is the total time, the, the, it's, it's the, actually the average time that the average molecule spends in the stationary phase times the function of theta times the exponential of minus the desorption rate constant times the time in the stationary phase plus the adsorption rate constant or oh, I wrote this badly. It's minus the sum of these two quantities, which are both positive. It's, it's, it's not a minus and a plus. It's minus the whole thing. Kd times Ts, the stationary phase average time. Ka, the adsorption rate constant. And Tm, the time in the mobile phase. That's the probability. Now, of course, I haven't told you anything yet because I haven't told you what the function i of theta is. 
I of theta is what's called a modified first order Bessel function. Theta is defined as 2 times Ka times Kd times Tm times Ts all to the 1 half power. So it's just a number. There is a modified first order Bessel function courtesy of Excel. If you go into the set of Excel functions called engineering functions. Bessel, there's like five different Bessel functions listed. This is a modified Bessel function. And then when, when, you, when, it, when you put that in there, it asks you what order Bessel function do you want. There's the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, left, twelfth, fourth, fifth, sixth. This is the first order Bessel function. And then you have to tell it, okay, of what quantity do you want me to give you the modified first order Bessel function, that's theta. And it looks like this. That's, that's all it is. And this function just keeps going up for nothing, up and up forever. Okay? Just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Look what we're multiplying it by. Exponential of minus a number. What's that look like? That function comes down like that, right? Well, what happens if you take the product of a function that goes up and a function that comes down? You get a peak. This is a peak. It's just not one that you can, you know, look at it. I mean, it doesn't, if you don't know the I1 theta, you got to look up the number. Get rid of that. However, I haven't told you the whole story yet. The actual function is this plus exponential minus KATM, adsorption rate constant, times the dead time of the column, the time that the molecules spend in the mobile phase, times the Dirac delta function of T minus Tm the delta of some quantity x is when x is equal to zero delta is equal to infinity when x is less than zero even minutely less than zero delta is equal to zero, and if x is greater than zero, delta is equal to zero, even minutely greater than zero. The delta function is an infinitely narrow, infinitely high function of area one. So you have to use your imagination. Okay, because it's infinitely high, but it's in, infinitely thin. So if you, if you multiply zero width by infinite height, that's an unknown number. But you can choose it to be one if you want to, and that's the way it's defined. So what this is saying is that the actual peak, there's a very, very sharp spike at T minus Tm equal to zero. T must be exactly equal to Tm, the dead time, and there'll be a sharp spike at the dead time. Those are the molecules that never adsorb at all. There aren't many of them, but they're the molecules that make it through the column without adsorbing even once. This term over here represents the molecules that go through the column and adsorb once twice, except for zero. And it's these which give you the broad peak 
And this is what gives you the spiky peak that I showed you when I said these don't absorb at all. They came, all came out together in a single sharp spike, and they came out at the dead time of the column. <coughs> Now, the dead time is simply the length of the column divided by the velocity that the solute molecules have when they're in the moving phase. So t, uh, U sub E represents the velocity of the mobile phase as it moves outside of the particles. We call this the interstitial velocity. And TM is the total time spent in the mobile phase. By the way, all molecules, regardless of how many times they adsorb, spend the same amount of time in the moving phase. Because if they spend that amount of time in the moving phase, moving at the interstitial velocity, they, they get to the end of the column and they come out. The time in the stationary phase is the product of the retention factor, K prime, and the time in the mobile phase. Now, Ts is an average property, it's <coughs> averaged over all the molecules. If a molecule adsorbs once and desorbs once, then it doesn't spend too much time in the stationary phase. If it adsorbs 50,000 times, then it's got to desorb 50,000 times. It spends more time in the stationary phase. If we, if we add up Tm and Tr, I'm sorry, Tm and Ts, we get Tr equal to Tm plus Ts. Now if you multiply everything cross by the flow rate, you get VR equals VM plus VS. K, K, remember TS is this, this, this K in it. So that would give you, you know, I could write this also as TM times one plus K prime. Now, what's important is what the plot looks like. So I took TM to be 100 seconds, and I took K prime to be 1, <coughs> just to give it some retention. And I varied the value of the desorption rate constant from uh, 0 0.1 up to 3. This is the fastest desorption rate constant that corresponds to that peak. So what I'm saying is the theta I theta, blah, 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 that gives you this peak. It's just, you just put it in your Excel spreadsheet, out comes the peak. The, the greater is the rate constant, the narrower is the peak. The higher is the rate constant, the more times it's going to adsorb and the more times it's going to desorb as it goes through the column. If the rate constant is low, then it only, it only adsorbs a few times and it desorbs a few times. As you lower the rate constant, the, P, the curve broadens out. <coughs> if you got a real good eyeball, you'll see that this peak maximum here is actually shifted in just a bit from that peak maximum. Okay? But the peak is now tailed. It's now asymmetric. It's, it's AB ratio that I talked about with the folding Dorsey stuff is now not one anymore. It's now tailed a bit. The, the longer time from the maximum to the 10% uh, point is wider than from before the maximum to the 10% point. And when we get out here, it's clearly shifted quite a bit. 
but all four of these curves have exactly the same first moment. They have exactly the same center of gravity. The time that the average molecule takes to come out is actually independent of that rate constant. It's governed only by Tm and K prime, the K prime being a thermodynamic parameter of the system. So even though this is a chemically, kinetically controlled process, the average molecule behaves as if the system is at thermodynamic equilibrium. The reason the peak spreads out is there's a bigger range in the, in the number of times the different molecules adsorb. And if we kept making KD bigger and bigger and bigger, make, make KD go up to infinity, the peak would be infinitely narrow. And all the molecules come out at the same time. Now, the uh, dead time of this column is right here. We took it as 100 seconds. According to this equation, there should be a very sharp spike located at the dead time. But you notice that the spike, the, the size of the spike depends upon the rate constant and the Tm. The Ka here times Tm is, since K prime is 1 and Kd is, the smallest Kd is 0 0.1, um, Ka would be 0 0.1 since K prime is 1, Tm is 100, exponential of minus 10. That's the size of the peak that, uh, that should be showing up here, exponential minus 10. That's a pretty small number. That's why you don't see it. But if we went to really, really slow kinetics, you would see a very sharp peak at the dead time, followed later by a broader peak. Does this ever happen? The answer is yes. It happens a lot when you're chromatographing proteins. Proteins are, some proteins are so big, they diffuse so slowly that some fraction of them will get through <coughs> the whole column without ever absorbing once. There are, are kinds of chromatography where the adsorption rate constant is inherently very small. Unfortunately, those are important kinds of chromatography. Of bioaffinity chromatography, which we'll touch up on briefly later, is really, really, really selective kind of chromatography. You see a lot of split peaks where you get a sharp peak followed by a really broad peak. Um, in, in metal affinity chromatography, where, where you're separating different ligands that like a particular metal, like you, you, you immobilize some copper two on a column, there, are, four, there are, are ligand binding processes can be quite slow with certain kinds of metals, certainly with chromium two, excuse me, chromium three, which is substitution in earth. It's a very slow process. You see split peaks. In conventional chromatography of small molecules, um, reverse phase chromatography, normal phase chromatography, gas chromatography, the adsorption and desorption rate constants are really fast, milliseconds. Your column dead times are at least a couple of seconds. You just don't see this phenomenon. It, 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 the peaks are just, dead peaks are just too small to see. Nasty function that Giddings and Irene derive and calculate its first moment. This is what its first moment is going to be. It, 
It depends upon k prime, which is the ratio of ka to kd, but it does not depend upon the absolute value of either ka or kd. Only the ratio. The ratio is a thermodynamic quantity. If I process it and get a second central moment, and then take the second central moment and convert it into an HETP, that HETP will be 2 times the velocity of the molecules as they move through the column, divided by the rate constant for desorption, times k prime over 1 plus k prime squared. This is an interesting result. Let's suppose we put in k prime equals 0. What's to tell you the plate height is? Zero. Zero. So there's no broadening. How can there be any broadening? If k prime is zero, does the stuff ever adsorb? So it's going to go through the column unadsorbed. They all come out at the same time. There's no broadening. As k prime gets bigger and bigger, then this h goes up and up and up. But look at the funny dependence. It's k prime over 1 plus k prime squared. There is actually a maximum in this when k prime is equal to 1. And then it comes back down. OK, how can that be? That doesn't make, that doesn't make a lot of sense at first, first thought. But if, if it's in the column a long time, if k prime is big, then ts is big. And it has a lot of time to desorb. So it can get, it, it does. And it's, it, 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 in other words, if it has a, enough time to desorb, the system's virtually at equilibrium. Because you've given it a lot of time. So there's a maximum in the K prime. And there are certainly, we certainly see this effect in real chromatography. The HETP gets bigger, the higher the velocity is. Well, think about the cartoons I showed you the other day. If, if, you're, if, you're, if your molecules are being pushed through the mobile phase real fast, you're not giving them much time to come to equilibrium. Conversely, if the rate constant is real big, they don't need much time to get to equilibrium. So that makes the HETP lower. Again, uh, when we see a chromatogram that looks like this, and we're injecting only one substance, I mean, if, if I had a mixture of A and B and I got a chromatogram that looked like that, I said, oh, there should be two peaks. So this is one compound gives two peaks. This is what we call a split peak problem. And this peak has an area equal to that. And the bigger the rate constant or the more bed time you give it, the sm smaller the peak is. I, I showed it as being a little tiny bit broad because there are, other, in fact, other broadening factors. Even, <coughs> even broadening outside the column would make that infinitely narrow peak appear to be a little bit wider. OK. That's, that's the preamble. Oh, I forgot to say something very important. I, even these rate constants are, are uh, fairly small. Let's say KD is three or bigger. This peak is really extremely Gaussian. If, if KD is three and say TM is ten or a hundred, hundred's only one and a half seconds anyway. I'm sorry, one and a half minutes for a dead time. So basically, this model. If you have a reasonable number of plates on the column, says that the peak is going to be Gaussian. 
Russia, just like the plate model. Okay, now, um, Giddings invented, I um, don't think discovered is the right word, but I say invented, or developed um, a lot of his concepts of, of peak broadening and chromatography by assuming that the molecules are actually undergoing something like the random processes that I've just talked about. And many people before Giddings, Giddings did his work in the, the 50s and 60s, um, the, the theory of diffusion and random walks goes back, um, well, to, to Brown and Brownian motion, which was the late 1800s, like 1860, 1870. But it was really Einstein who laid the mathematical foundation for understanding random walk processes. Um, in fact, this was one of his three great papers in 1903, his, his miraculous year, when he, he had the paper on uh, random walk, the paper on um, the photoelectric effect, in other words, quantum chemistry, quantum physics, and uh, the, the special relativity papers all came out in one year. Um, but this is Einstein's basic equation for random walks. Sigma x is squared is the variance of the distribution in, in distance units. That's why I put x on it for distance. And it's equal to n times l squared. N is the number of random steps. And L is the step size. Now, in a simple random walk, which is what this equation is for, it assumes you can only move back and forth in a single dimension. It, you can't move x, y, z. You can only move x. So you can take a step forward in x. You can take a step backward in x. That's what you're confined to do, number one. Number two, the simple random walk says that your step size is constant. Okay, well, if you've ever had a few drinks too many, you know that, that your step size is not constant. That, that develops a somewhat more complicated equation, but basically it boils down to L is the average step size. So we may as well take it as being a constant. Now, um, so if you know N and you know L, then you can predict the variance of the distribution. So that's one way to get at it. Another way to get at it is to just use the result of fixed laws. And in one dimension, the variance of the distribution is equal to 2 times the diffusion coefficient times time. So if you happen to know the diffusion coefficient of the molecule that's moving randomly, and you know how much time you've given it to move randomly, you can use this equation to predict the variance of the distribution. Gidding said, I know both of these equations are right. Let me apply them when it's most convenient to apply them. And from, from that, I will be able to calculate the broadening that goes on in the column for a given type of process. Now, there's more than one kind of process that can lead to random stepping. The adsorption-desorption situation that I just discussed is one such process. And that corresponds to the C term in the Van Diemter equation. Simple longitudinal diffusion along the axis of the column is another entirely separate independent kind of random motion. N different kinds of independent processes that are all random, the total variance 
would be simply the sum of all of those independent variances. Not sum of sigmas, the sum of sigma squared. Since my HETP is equal to the sigma squared divided by L, if I've got a bunch of independent processes all causing random motion, the H total from all of them is the sum of each sigma squared divided by L, or it's the sum of sigma squared all added up divided by L. We can factor the L out because it's only one common. So this is the whole basis of Giddings' random walk model, where he's going to apply this to various broadening processes, which is what we'll go through um, on Monday and perhaps part of Wednesday. But it, it, it's, this is all the mathematics you need to know. You don't need to know Bessel functions and all of that stuff. That's the background. <coughs> that, that says that this is right, that you can do this. But this is the essence of the, the theory of random walk processes. Okay, we'll catch you Monday. Right